many of y'all ready for God's word this morning? Say amen. amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm ready. ready. Turn to your other neighbor and say, I'm ready. ready. Some of y'all are on the end row and you're thinking, uh, nobody responded when I turned that way. <laughs> After extensive training, there was a young man by the name of Greg whose desire was to win the track division of the 2004 Olympic Games in Athens, Greece. Greg had trained hard for years. He had worked himself to death. His muscles were in place. His stamina was exactly where it needed to be. He had done everything perfect, and he could not wait for this day to arrive. And the day came. The gun sounded, and Greg ran as hard when the day came as he had ever run before. Greg ran, and he ran, and he ran, and he crossed the finish line. But it wasn't in first place. You see, first place is what Greg had been training for. First place was what Greg had been dreaming about. First place was what his plans were built upon. But he crossed the finish line in sixth place. What happened? I mean, Greg just knew that God was going to favor him and that God was going to give him a boost and he was going to pass up all the runners and he was going to cross that line in first place and he was going to give God all the glory for what God had done in his life. Greg just knew he was going to win the race in first place. He was so disappointed. He was so discouraged. Greg went home to face some of the most difficult days he had ever faced in his life. He felt like a failure. Greater than that, Greg felt like that God had let him down. He trusted God to do what he thought needed to be done. And for some reason, God did not come through. God had let Greg down. He felt like God had failed him miserably. But that was just the time he was learning to trust God. It was the next Sunday that Greg walked into his church and he sat down and he was somewhat angry with God and he was disappointed and he was discouraged and he sat down and all he could think about was the race. Why God did you not let me win the race? Why God could you not have given me a boost and put me across the finish line in first place? God you know I would have given you glory. You know I would have given it all to you. And he whined and he cried and moaned and groaned all throughout the service. At the end of the service, he went forward and he knelt down to pray. His pastor walked over to him and he said, Greg, he said, I've been meaning to talk to you. He said, I believe God's calling you to lead the student ministry in our church. And Greg said, Pastor, I'm not good enough to win a race. I don't know if I can do that or not. And the pastor said, Greg, if you'll accept, you will have just won first place. You see, our plans are not always God's plans. We have plans of grandeur. We have plans the, of, of winning. We have plans of, of doing this or doing that. But I want you to understand today that God is the one who sets the standard for moral truth, his absolute truth. And he also sets the plan in place for your life and mine. In fact, as our creator, God knows what's best for us. Oh, we think we know what's best for us. Greg just knew that winning that race, coming in first place, would have been what was best for him. But do you realize that had Greg won that race first place, 
he would never have been able to accept the position of student pastor in his local church. Understand God has a plan for our lives. God is completely unique. God is wholly different from any other God that people may worship. God created us and God loves us. And the truth is that no one understands us better than our designer. Nobody knows us better than our creator. God has a plan. God has a standard for each of our lives. And most of the time in our lives, we find ourselves questioning and asking ourselves many times, God, why should I trust you? Why should I trust your plan? Why should I trust your standard for my life? Why, why, why? Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 6. Probably some of my all-time favorite verses in the Scripture. Read like this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not... On your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. There are things that happen in our lives that we just don't understand. There are times in our lives when plans that we have made perfectly and it seemed like everything was lined up and everything should have happened just the way we thought it would. But at last minute, there's a glitch. Something happens. Things change. Things don't come out like we thought they would. Maybe you've been in those situations in your life. Maybe you've asked the very same question, why should I trust God? Maybe you didn't get the job that you wanted when you got hired by the company you now work for. Maybe you wanted one job and they hired you, but it wasn't for that job, it was for a totally different job. Or maybe you went to get a job and you didn't get hired. And you really wanted that job. And your plan was to have that job. But God opened the door for another job. A job that had better hours. So that you could come and be in worship with your church family. A job that offered you more money. So that your needs would be met. A job that had benefits because the other job you wanted didn't have benefits. But a job that would put you around people that needed to hear the gospel and your story and your life. Whereas the other job would not have put you in that place. Teenagers, maybe you didn't make the team that you wanted to play for. Maybe you didn't get the position that you wanted to play on the team. Maybe somebody overlooked you. Maybe somebody didn't see your full potential. But God did. Parents, maybe your plans didn't work out the way you wanted them to for that perfect vacation you had planned. Everything was ready to go. Everything was paid for. Everything was lined out. And all of a sudden, COVID hit. Maybe everything was lined up and everything was set. And you were so looking forward to that vacation. And one of the kids got sick. And you couldn't go. I don't know about you, I'd have locked them up in the storage shed out back and I'd have went anyways, amen? I might would have come back home to the police sitting on my front porch (laughs) waiting on me. Maybe things went completely different in your life than you planned for them to. Maybe you had your heart and your mind set on college, or maybe you had your mind set on the military, young lady. Maybe maybe you had everything worked out on your plan, and something happened. 
and you got pregnant. You didn't get to go to the military. You didn't get to go to college like you wanted to. You know what I love about God's plan? He can take a bad plan and he can turn it around for his good. For your good and his glory. You see, but I made a mistake. Listen to me. God can take your mistake, your mess up, and can turn it into a message for all the world to hear. God can take wherever you are and whatever you've gone through, and he can turn it around for your good and for his glory. Maybe you got laid off from your job, and maybe you can't seem to find another one. And you feel like God's let you down. Maybe you've lost people in your life that you thought would always be there. Maybe you thought you had a great marriage and all of a sudden you came home one day and there was a letter on the table that said, I'm done. It's over. I want out. Maybe for you, maybe it was your one supporter Maybe the one person that you love the most and you got that call that said they just passed. Maybe it's a relationship you wanted. Maybe a relationship that you wanted so bad. But then when you got it, it wasn't all that it was cracked up to be. A lot of people are asking questions just like that. Why? Why should I even trust God at all? If you're taking notes this morning, I want to give you two reasons. I want you to understand, first of all, that you and I can trust God's standards. Because He speaks truth. And He is truth. God always speaks truth. When I think about that passage, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. I love it when somebody says, well, I went ahead and I made this decision because I was going with my heart. I don't go by my heart anymore. <laughs> I've gone by my heart a few times and it didn't turn out so well, right? Right? You know why? Because the Bible says the heart of man is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? Right. Listen, my heart gets me in trouble sometimes. Yeah. Listen, I, I, listen, I know when you look at me, you see this big, stout, <laughs> masculine muscles. All right, I tried. <laughs> you, you see this guy that's got, you know, if I, if I were to show you, you'd see these abs bursting forward. Okay, I'm dreaming. Stop. I, it's okay for me to dream. I'm dreaming here. My heart gets me in trouble. My heart wants things that are not good for me. Well, I'm just, I'm just going with my heart. Don't do that. Instead, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't trust your heart. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Yeah, but I, I thought this made sense. Don't, don't trust what makes sense. Don't trust what sounds good. Well, you know, my logic says, well, you know what? Most days I find that that is the problem. Most people don't have logic. Amen? Amen. There is no logic. If you're a parent, sometimes your kids do something and they say, well, I, I thought this was what was best. And I'm going, where was the logic in that? That is not smart at all. 
That was, where in the world did you start to think that was a great idea? Right? Yeah. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, in every area of your life, whatever circumstance, whatever situation you find yourself in, acknowledge Him. Why? Because He speaks truth. He is truth. Do you know that people are often known by their character? That their character is the essence of who they are as an individual. In the book of Isaiah chapter 45 verses 18 and 19, it says, For, the, for thus says the Lord God who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who established it, who did not create it in vain, was it by accident? Who formed it to be inhabited? Watch this. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Hallelujah. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I did not say to the seed of Jacob, Seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. In other words, God himself created the earth to be inhabited by man and then he chose to reveal himself in a clear and understandable language. Isn't that amazing? In other words, he did not create chaotically. Nor does he communicate chaotically. But God is perfectly and decently in order. In fact, God revealed himself in truth and righteousness as the absolute and supreme God. So God speaks truth. Why? Because he is truth. That's the only thing he can speak. It is the very character and the essence of God. Look at verses 22 and 23. He says, look to me and be saved. All you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. I have sworn by myself. Stop and think about that for a moment. I have sworn by myself. The word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return that to me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall take an oath. Did you catch what he said? He said, I have sworn by myself. In other words, he's establishing the fact that he is truth and therefore because he is truth, I can swear by myself. He doesn't have to swear by anybody else. He doesn't have to use anybody else as a foundation. He doesn't have to use anything else as the model for truth and righteousness. He said, I myself am truth. I am righteousness and therefore I swear by myself. And then in John 14, 6, we see Jesus comes along and Jesus establishes that truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except for by me. Here we find Jesus telling Thomas and the others that he himself is truth, meaning that God himself is the embodiment of truth and he cannot mislead. I want you to understand that you and I can trust God because he will never lead us astray. God will never lead us down a wrong path. Whatever God leads you in is exactly where you need to go and exactly what you need to be doing. And nothing with God is ever happenstance. Nothing with God is ever a coincidence.
purpose it ends. God has a plan and desired purpose for each of our lives, and he will do whatever is necessary to get you and I from point A to point B to point C so that when we get to point C, he is already in the destination. He is already there waiting on us. Wait a minute. I thought he was with us in leading us. He is. He is everywhere all the time and full of truth. He's with us leading us in point A. He is leading us in point B. And he is already there waiting on you and I in point C. It is the absolute plan of God. There is no better plan than God's plan. I think it's interesting. There's an old fable that might help point out God's character a little more. He said one day there was a scorpion that arrived at the bank of a river and he wanted to cross, but he couldn't find a way to get to the other side. And so he saw a frog nearby and he asked the frog, Frog, will you take me across the river on your back? And the frog refused. Ribbit, ribbit. I will not because you'll sting me. And the scorpion stood up and defended himself. And he said, that would be foolish for me to sting you because then we would both drown. The scorpion's words seemed logical though. It made sense. Okay. All right. So the frog agreed to carry the scorpion across the river. However, when they were about halfway across the river, the scorpion stung the frog. And the stung frog asked, Why'd you sting me? That makes no sense. Now we're both going to die. And the scorpion replied, I'm a scorpion. And that's what scorpions do. See, the point is, it was the scorpion's character to sting. It is God's character to be truthful. God cannot lie. He cannot deceive because he in himself is truth. He will always lead you and me in the right way. You can always guarantee it. You know why we have a hard time trusting God's plan for our life? Because it wasn't our plan for our life and we like to be in control. Amen? And how trust a God that I cannot see with my eyes? How can I trust a God that, that I, I can't actually feel with my hands? How can I possibly trust a God like that? How did you trust a God who sent his son Jesus to die for you and I on an old rugged cross to save us from our sins? By grace, through faith. You did it by faith. Oh, but I, that, that's different. That's different. No, it's not. If you can trust God to save you and to keep you out of hell, you and I can trust God to lead us in the right path in life and get us where we need to go to bring great good for our lives and great glory to his name. We can trust God because he is truth. He will never lead us in the wrong way. But secondly, you can trust God's standards because he is good. God is good and God wants good for you. When I look around today, you see today's culture has varying views of God. In our culture, people see God from everything from the affectionate grandfather in the sky to the Santa Claus to the wrathful judge. Everybody has a view of God. Everybody has some sort of perspective, some sort of view in which they see him as. To some people, he's the big man upstairs. To some people, he's a faithful and compassionate friend. To some people, he's a genie in a bottle. To some people, he's Santa Claus. To some, he's a grandfather. To others, 
He's a dad standing at the door with a two by four waiting to whack you every time you do something wrong. You see, everybody has a different view of God. Many people view God as this distant being who's not really involved in the lives of people. He's just like this non-personal God that's way out there in the universe somewhere and he really could care less about my life or yours. But that's not true at all. In the book of Psalm 100, verse number 5, the scripture tells us, For the Lord is good. The Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and His truth endures to all generations. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and His truth, 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 absolute truth endures to all generations. You know what some people tell you today? That the truth for you is not the same truth for me. But that is a lie from the enemy. How do I know it's from the enemy? Because God is truth and he cannot lie. Satan is a liar and he is the father of all lies. God is good. His mercy is everlasting. And his truth endures for all generations. Listen, what was good for the early generation is good for this generation, is good for the next generation. Amen. Truth right. is truth. It is not relevant per se as some would have you and I believe that it is. Truth is truth. And it's the same for all people. Just as truth is part of God's character, so is goodness. Think, what are some of the evidences that God is good? How do we know God is good? He's good and that he shows mercy instead of justice. Do you realize that each one of us, if we got what we deserve, we deserve eternal punishment in a place called hell. Oh, listen, there are people today who will tell you that hell is not real, honey, it is. It awaits. It is the place where the fire is quenched not. It is a place of eternal darkness. It is a place where all five senses will be felt. Hell is just as real as heaven is real. See, we like to believe that heaven is real because heaven is known as that sweet and glorious forever. It is the place where there's no more pain, no more sorrow, no more separation, and full of chocolate. Woo! Hallelujah! Amen. That's heaven. I don't know about the chocolate part, but it sounds good anyways. But nobody ever wants to talk about hell because hell is a place of torment and punishment. But God clearly says there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. Hell was not created for you and for me. It was created for Satan and his wicked demons and for all of those who refuse to follow Jesus. For all of those who refuse to follow Jesus. Whoa, 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 wait, wait. I just had somebody tell me just the other day. I was doing a funeral and this lady asked me, this is the second one of these I've had in about two months. I was doing a funeral. I'm talking to the mother of the person who had died. And I said to the mother, I said, can you tell me about their spiritual background? She said, none. She said, now I grew up Catholic. She said, I had all the sacraments. I had all of this. She said, do you think my sacraments would cover my daughter? I said, ma'am, your sacraments won't even cover you. She looked at me. She said, what? I, I said, your sacraments won't cover you, and they certainly won't cover your daughter. And she said, what do you mean? Because there was only one sacrifice 
that was able to cover the sins of all mankind. And that is Jesus Christ. He is the perfect, spotless lamb. And she said, do you think you could do a couple of Hail Marys and could we, could you pray her into heaven? And I said, ma'am, what's been done has been done. The decision that she has made has already taken place and there's nothing I can do nor you can do to change any of that. You and I have to make the decision while we're living alert and cognizant to make Jesus the Lord of our lives. It's only one sacrifice. And it was once and for all. Never to be done again. I love when I go over to Africa uh, around the time of Ramadan. And then in the uh, October months, they have another big festival. And they're uh, bringing all these animals. They're sacrificing all these animals. And literally blood is running through the streets. Sometimes it is literally an inch to two inches thick of blood rolling through the streets. And when you go door to door, house to house, and you talk to people, they say, oh, we're getting ready to sacrifice. And you have to explain to them, we don't have to sacrifice anymore. The one sacrifice has already been given. We don't have to do that anymore. You see, if it worked, it would have worked in the Old Testament Levitical system. And it didn't work then either. God saw that it didn't work. And he said there must be one final sacrifice. The spotless lamb. Jesus Christ. He is the only one. But it pains my heart when I hear people say, Oh, could you pray them into heaven? Oh, how it breaks my heart. Because there are some people that don't understand that God's mercy has already made available for them eternal life in a place called heaven. Some people just don't get it. They don't understand it. But that is certainly one of the ways that I see God is good. He heals our sicknesses and our disease. I'm thankful that he heals us of the sin sick disease. Aren't you? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I am so grateful that in my sin sick disease, oh listen, there's only two deaths. You're either dead in sin or you're dead to sin. You you see where I'm headed there? there? There is death in sin. I don't want to be dead in my sin and trespasses. I want to be dead to sin. Why? Because of the glorious blood of Jesus that shed abroad mercy, mercy, mercy. He gives us his abiding presence in our lives. I just was talking to a guy the other day and I said, can you imagine If you had to walk through life without Jesus, can you imagine what a horrible existence life would be if you and I had to go through life without the abiding presence of God? I don't know about you, but I couldn't make it. Listen, it's hard enough going through life with the abiding presence of God. I can't imagine what it would be like if I had to do it without him. I would have probably ended it a long time ago. I'm like, man, sometimes I go crazy as it is. Can you imagine without him? Oh, that's the goodness of God. It is the goodness of God that allows you to enjoy the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit of God in our lives as followers of Jesus. Can you trust God to be good? Even those circumstances and situations around you don't look good. It's hard. It's hard. When when everything in your life seems to be falling apart, do you realize that it might just be falling into place? It, It might be God putting the pieces of the puzzle into the place. 
place where it needs to go so that you can experience the goodness of God and so that God will experience the glory that he so deserves. Do you realize your plans and my plans don't bring God glory? In fact, many times my plans rob God of his glory. I remember many times parents of teenagers or children saying to me, I don't understand why my child died. I don't understand why God took my baby. And I just heard this again yesterday. A little lady stood there. We're in the parking lot. I just preached the funeral of her daughter. 33 years old. Perfect health. No struggles at all. She worked at Walmart in Lakeland. And there were probably 15 people that stood and talked about how that this young girl was the bright star of Walmart. She was the encourager for every worker there. And they said, you know, when our shift was going bad, when things were going bad, said she would show up and put a smile on your face. All the people who shopped at Walmart wanted to go through her line because she'd always have you laughing. She'd always build you up. She'd always encourage you. 33 years old. And her mom stood there in the parking lot. She grabbed me. She laid her head on my chest and she wept uncontrollably. She said, Pastor D, why did God take my baby? 33 years old, so young, so full of life. Why? 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 And all I could tell her was, ma'am, we don't know the plan of God. All we can know is that we have to trust it. We don't see the big picture. We don't understand the grander things that are about to come. We don't know what God is trying to do in us. We don't have a clue. It don't make it any easier. If I could have taken her pain away, I would have. If there was something I could have said that would have uh, uh, helped her in her moment, I, I would have. But there was nothing. All I can say is that we must trust God. He's supreme. And in our pain and in our brokenness and in our sorrow, sometimes it is so hard to trust the goodness of God when the circumstances around us say otherwise. Yes, we can. We can trust God to be good even though our circumstances and situations don't look good. It's because his character. He is truth and he is good. And he wants what's good for you. But how could it be good? How could God personally think that taking a child is good? How could he possibly think that? All I know is this. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And while it's not logical and it doesn't make sense to me, it is totally logical to God. And it happens every single day. There are times when I have seen with my own eyes the goodness and the glory of God for a bad situation. There have been times that I have seen, uh, I, I preached one time the funeral of a 14-year-old girl. And I remember before anybody got to the church, I stood there and I looked over into her lifeless body. And all I could think to myself was, God, what is your plan? This makes no sense to me. 
that night I stood and I preached her funeral in front of a thousand teenagers. And I saw hundreds of her friends give their heart and life to Jesus. You say, but it's so cruel, it's so wrong that God would take my child but let all of these other people live. Do you understand? God himself said, I let you take my child so that all of you could live. He understands the pain. He understands the sorrow. And he hurts and mourns and grieves with us. In our pain. And while we don't understand it, we can trust that the truth is all things work together for the good of those who are the called according to his purpose. All things, the good, the bad, the ugly, God is working all of those things together for our good, even when it doesn't seem like it. You see, it really doesn't matter whether or not we won't accept God's truth. It doesn't matter whether we won't accept His goodness. The fact is, He will continue to remain consistent to His character, regardless of what we do. He is God, and we are creation. And what we really need to do is simply stop trusting our own standards. Stop trusting our own plans, our own ways, and give it to Him. This morning, God is calling for us to quit trying to play the role of God in our life. He's calling us, quit trying to be in control of everything that's going on in your life and give it to him and let him take over. And you and I get back to being the creation that he's intended for us to be. You know, it's that old saying, let go and let God. It's true. For when you do, you and I are going to experience the goodness of God in our lives. Because that's exactly what he wants. So let me ask the question in closing. What would your life look like if you took your hands off the steering wheel today and you let God direct you wherever he chooses? What would your life look like in mine if we took our yes and put it on the table before God and said, God, I will do whatever you want me to do. Yes. I'll go wherever you want me to go. Oh, I remember that day. I remember the day that I put my yes on the table of God and it took me from Knoxville, Tennessee all the way to Plant City, Florida. Somebody said, man, do you ever regret that day? No. Oh, oh, do I miss home? Yeah. My mom's still there. My brother's there. I got a ton of friends and a whole lot of family still in Tennessee. But do I ever regret putting my yes on the table? Not one single moment. And if I had it to do all over again, I'd do it all over again. I don't regret it one bit. I, I stood here last Sunday. And I looked out between two services and I saw 305 people worshiping Jesus. And I remember that just two years earlier that there were about 15, 20 on a good day people scattered across this auditorium. Trying to find purpose. And I stood here and I looked out at 305 people and I went home and I literally wept over what God has done. And let me tell you why. Because he'll do the same thing in every single one of our lives if we'll put our yes on the table. And we will trust him with the plan of our lives. You may be here today and you may be hurting and broken so bad that you can't even begin to see through to trust in God, let alone putting your yes on the table. But how would the situation in your life look differently 
if you stop trying to figure it out, if you stop trying to control the outcome and you started letting God be responsible and you just be content with being you. Listen, none of us in this room today can change what's been done to us. Everybody here has been hurt. Everybody here has had horrible things happen to us in our lives. Physically, mentally, emotionally. Some of you are here today and you won't even give grace away a chance. You know why? You've been hurt so bad at another church. You were at another church and somebody abused you spiritually or people that were supposed to be God's people turned out being demonites. They hurt you. They broke you. It could have just been because they're imperfect. Could have just been that maybe they were spiritually immature and what they thought they were doing the right thing and they weren't doing the right thing, but nonetheless you got hurt anyways and you vowed, I will never let another church hurt me. And so you'll live your life carrying that hurt, carrying that grief, carrying that brokenness because you haven't yet trusted God with the plan of your life. You know, I I tell you, I've been hurt by a lot of churches. Any pastor will tell you, Pastor Charlie, you know what I'm talking about. Any pastor will tell you, if you're going to be a pastor, you can mark it up. You are going to get hurt by a church. But what if after I got hurt by a church, I just said, I'm not doing it no more. I'm not preaching again. I'm not ever pastoring again. What I had to do is I had to say, God, I'm going to take that hurt and I'm going to lay it on the altar. I'm going to give it to you and I'm going to trust you for my healing. I'm going to trust you to get me over it and I'm going to trust you to take me to the next place even if it means I get hurt again. Because you know what? I don't do what I do for a church. I do what I do for the one who called me. When I wake up in the morning, I don't wake up and go, I wonder if somebody's going to like me today. I wonder if somebody's going to dislike me today. I wake up this morning and I say, God, as imperfect as I am before you, I am wonderfully and fearfully created. Everything that is within me is exactly the way you wanted it. And God, everything I've gone through, you knew exactly what was happening in my life before I knew about it. So I'm going to trust you to take care of me. Some of you this morning, you need to bring your broken plans, your broken dreams, and you need to lay them on the altar and leave it there. Some of you need to bring your hurts, your sorrows, your grief, and lay it on the altar and leave it there. Some of you this morning need to forgive yourselves for some stupid things you've done in your past. And we've all got stupid in our past. Amen? We've all stepped into stupid at some point. We need to take that and bring it to the altar and quit holding ourselves hostage. Lay it on the altar. Let it go. Release it. And trust him because he is truthful and because he is good. Listen, you can trust God this morning. I promise you. I've been trusting him all my life and he has never led me wrong. Stand with me if you will this morning. You're here this morning. Maybe you've recently given your life to Jesus and you've not followed the Lord and believers' baptism. And maybe this morning, you know, the enemy has sold you the lie that, you know, you need to grow some more before you get baptized. No, that's a lie. When you and I get saved, we need to be baptized so that it doesn't hinder our spiritual growth. You need to just move on it. There are some of us today who got a lot of things we need to lay at the altar. 
Some of us need to lay a marriage that didn't work out and ended in divorce. And you let what happened to you become your identity. You let what's going on in your life define you and who you are. Can I tell you, nothing that you've gone through is your identity. Nothing that you've ever done is your identity. I've got a friend that ended up in prison. He's out. He's doing well. But every day of his life, all he talks about, I messed up and went to prison. I messed up and went to prison. I looked at him one day and I said, shut up. You are not a prisoner anymore. That is something that happened to you. It is not who you are in Jesus' name. You are called. You're appointed. You are forgiven. You are loved. You are full of grace. You are overwhelmed by mercy. You're a child of the King. Start living like it. I don't know what it is that you need to bring and lay at this altar today, but I can tell you this. When you come and you lay it down, leave it there. Don't get up and take it back with you. When you lay it on the altar, you say, God, here, you weep, you cry, you scream, you do whatever you got to do to lay it down. But you just say, God, here it is. It's consumed me. It's become my identity. It has broken me. It keeps me in bondage. It keeps me as a hostage. But today, I'm laying it on the altar of God. I am letting it go. And Satan, shut your face. I ain't taking it back with me when I get up. You leave it there, and then you get up and you walk back to your seat, and you start declaring over yourself, I am free. I am free. I am free. I'm not living under those chains. I'm not, listen, I don't care what other people said about you. But Pastor, you don't understand. People told me that I'm not good enough. I'll never be good enough. I'll never accomplish anything. That's a lie from the pit of hell. You don't listen to that? Don't listen to the lie of the devil. God said, you are blessed. You are highly favored. You're a royal priesthood. You're part of the kingdom of the saved, the redeemed. Amen? Amen. Start living like who you are, not what happened to you. Right. Not where you've been, not what's been done to you. That's all stuff. But it's your past. It's not your future. But if you keep hanging on to it, it'll become your future. Hello? Let it go. Are you ready? I'm going to pray. And Pastor Charlie's going to start singing. I don't want you to walk. I want you to run to this altar. Lay it down and let it go. I just have a feeling some folks are fixing to get free this morning. All right? Somebody's about to start trusting God and walking in freedom. Here we go. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you that right now you're speaking to hearts and lives. I thank you that you're speaking to people who are hurting. Lord, there are some people that even now while we're praying, they are getting up and they are running to the altar and they are laying it down right now. They ain't even waiting on me to finish praying, God, because they're hurting, they're broken, they're in bondage, they're in prison, and this morning they want to be loosed and set free. And the only way to do that, God, is let it go, lay it down, and start trusting you for what you want to do in their lives. God, have your will in your way right now. In Jesus' name, amen.